Getting Up a Pantomime by George Augustus Sala. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas is coming. Cold weather, snow in the streets, mince pies, and our little boys and girls home for the holidays. Kind hearted people's donations for the poor boxes turkeys from the country goose clubs in town plums and candied citron in the windows of the grocer's shops hot elder wine snapdragon hunt the slipper and the butchers and bakers quarterly bills the great anniversary of humanity gives signs of its approach and with it the joyfulness and unbending and unstarching of white neckcloths and genial charity, and genial handshaking and good fellowship, which once a year at least dispel the fog of caste and prejudice in this land of England. Christmas is coming, and in his jovial train come also the pantomimes. Goodness, though we know them all by heart, how we love those same pantomimes still! Though we have seen the same clowns steal the same sausages, and have been asked by the pantaloon, How are we tomorrow? for years and years, how we delight in the same clown and pantaloon still. There can't be anything aesthetic in a pantomime. It must be deficient in the unities. It has no epopoeia or anything in the shape of dramatic property connected with it, yet it must have something good about it to make us roar at the old, old jokes, and wonder at the old tricks, and be delighted with the old spangled fairies and coloured fires. Perhaps there may be something in the festive season, something contagious in the wintry jollity of the year that causes us church wardens householders hard men of business that we may be forget parochial squabbles taxes and water rates discount and adiutage for hours and enter heart and soul into participation and appreciation of the mysteries of harlequin fee fo fum or the enchanted fairy of the island of abracadabra possibly there may be something in the shrill laughter the ecstatic hand-clapping the shouts of triumphant laughter of the little children yonder it may be after all that the sausages and the spangles the tricks and coloured fires of harlequin fee fo fum may strike some long-forgotten chords rummage up long-hidden sympathies wake up kindly feelings and remembrances of things that were ere parochial squabbles water rates and discount had being when we too were little children when our jackets buttoned over our trousers and we wore frills round our necks and long blue sashes round our waists else why should something like a wateriness in the eye and a huskiness in the throat not sorrowful though come over us amid the most excruciatingly comic portion of the comic business else why should the lights and the music the children's laughter and the spangled fairies conjure up that mind picture half dim and half distinct of our christmases years ago of mangnall's questions and emancipation from the cane of grandmamma who always kept sweet stuff in her pockets of uncle william who was never without a store of half crowns wherewith to tip us of poor sister gussie who died of the childish joys and griefs the hopes and fears of christmas in the year eighteen hundred and <clears throat> never mind how many hip 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 for the pantomime however exultingly watch the clown through his nefarious career roar at jack pudding tumbling 
admire the paint on his face, marvel at the halls of splendour and glittering coral caves of the genius of the sea, till midnight comes and the green baize curtain rolls slowly down and brown holland draperies cover the ormolu decorations of the boxes. Then, if you can spare half an hour, send the little children home to Brompton with the best of governesses, and tarry a while with me, while I discourse of what goes on behind that same green curtain, of what has gone on before the clown could steal his sausages, or the spangled fairy change an oak into a magic temple, or the coloured fires light up the home of beauty in the lake of the silver swans. Let me, as briefly and succinctly as I can, endeavour to give you an idea of the immense labour and industry and perseverance, of the nice ingenuity and patient mechanical skill, of the various knowledge necessary, nay, indispensable, ere Harlequin fee-fo-fum can be put upon the stage, ere the green bays can rise, disclosing the coral caves of the genius of the sea. Let us put on the cap of Fortunio and the stilts of Asmodeus. Let us go back to when the pantomime was but an embryo of comicality, and in its progress towards the glory of full-blown pantomimehood, watch the labours of the ants behind the bays. Ants, without exaggeration, for if ever there was a human anthill, the working department of a theatre is something of that sort. And mere amusement, your mere enlightenment on a subject of which my readers may possibly be ignorant, are not the sole objects I have in view. I do honestly think that the theatrical profession and its professors are somewhat calumniated, that people are rather too apt to call theatres sinks of iniquity and dens of depravity, and to set down all actors as a species of diverting vagabonds who have acquired a knowledge of their calling without study and exercise it without labour. I imagine that if a little more were known of how hard-working, industrious and persevering theatricals as a body generally are, of what has to be done behind the scenes of a theatre and how it is done for our amusement, we should look upon the drama with a more favourable eye, and look upon even poor Jack Pudding, when he has washed the paint off his face, with a little more charity and forbearance. Fortunio capped, then, we stand in the green room of the Theatre Royal Hatton Garden, one bleak November morning, while the stage manager reads the manuscript of the opening to the new grand pantomime of Harlequin fee fo fum The dramatic performers, the pantomimists, are not present at this reading, the lecture being preliminary and intended for the sole behoof of the working ants of the theatrical ant hill. The fighting ants will have another reading to themselves. This morning are assembled the scene painter, an individual bespattered from head to foot with splashes of various colours, attired in a painted ragged blouse, a battered cap, and slipshod slippers. You would be rather surprised to see him turn out when his work is over, dressed like a gentleman, as he is, and an accomplished gentleman to boot. Near him is the property man, also painted and bespattered, and strongly perfumed with a mingled odour of glue and turpentine. Then there is the carpenter, who twirls a wide-awake hat between his fingers, and whose attire generally betrays an embroidery of shavings. The leader of the band is present. On the edge of a chair sits the author, not necessarily a seedy man with long hair and a manuscript peeping out of his coat pocket, but a well-to-do looking gentleman, probably, with rather a nervous air just now, and wincing somewhat as the droning voice of the stage manager gives utterance to his comic combinations, and his creamiest jokes are met with immovable stolidity from the persons present. Catch them laughing. The scene-painter is thinking of heavy set, 
cuts and cut cloths instead of quips and conundrums the carpenter cogitates on sinks and slides strikes and pulls the property man ponders ruefully on the immense number of comic masks to model and coral branches to paint while the master and mistress of the wardrobe whom we have hitherto omitted to mention mentally cast up the number of ells of glazed calico silk satin and velvet required lastly enthroned in awful magnificence in some dim corner sits the management a portly port wine voiced management maybe with a white hat and a double eyeglass with a broad ribbon this incarnation of theatrical power throws in an occasional good at which the author colours and sings a mental paean varied by an ejaculation of can't be done at which the dramatist winces dreadfully the reading over a short desultory conversation follows it would be better mr brush the painter suggests to make the first scene a close in and not a sink mr tax the carpenter machinist we mean intimates in a somewhat threatening manner that he shall want a power of nails and screws while the master of the wardrobe repudiates with respectful indignation an economical suggestion of the management touching the renovation of some old ballet dresses by means of new spangles and the propriety of cutting up an old crimson velvet curtain used some years before into costumes for the supernumeraries as to the leader of the band he is slowly humming over a very little warbler of popular airs which he thinks he can introduce while the stage manager pencil in hand fights amicably with the author as to the cuts necessary to make the pantomime read with greater smartness all however agree that it will do and to each working ant is delivered a plot of what he or she has to manufacture by a given time generally a month or six weeks from the day of reading mr brush has a plot of so many pairs of flats and wings so many borders and set pieces so many cloths and backings mr tax has a similar one as it is his department to prepare the canvases and machinery on which mr brush subsequently paints mr tagg the wardrobe keeper is provided with a list of the fairies demons kings guards and slaves costumes he is required to confectionne and mr rosin the leader is presented with a complete copy of the pantomime itself in order that he may study its principal points and arrange characteristic music for it as for poor mr gorget the property man he departs in a state of pitiable bewilderment holding in his hand a portentous list of properties required from regal crowns to red-hot pokers he impetuously demands how's it all to be done in a month done it will be notwithstanding the stage manager departs in a hurry in which stage managers generally are twenty hours out of the twenty-four and in trapping the clown in the passage who is an eccentric character of immense comic abilities and distinguished for training all sorts of animals from the goose which follows him like a dog to a jackass foal which resides in his sitting-room enters into an animated pantomimic conversation with him discoursing especially of the immense number of bits of fat for him the clown in the pantomime the author's name we need not mention it will appear in the bill as it has appeared in and across many bills stamped and unstamped before when the officials have retired he remains a while with the management the subject of conversation mainly relating to a piece of grey paper addressed to messrs coots drummonds or childs for the next few days though work has not actually commenced in all its vigour great preparations are made forests of timber so to speak are brought in at the stage door also bales of canvas huge quantities of stuffs for the wardrobe 
foil paper, spangles, and Dutch metal generally. Firkins of size and barrels of whitening arrive for Mr. Brush, hundred weights of glue and gold leaf for Mr. Gorget, not forgetting the power of nails and screws for Mr. Tax. Another day, and the ants are all at work behind the bays for Harlequin fee fo fum Fortunio's cap will stand us in good stead again, and we had better attach ourselves to the skirts of the stage manager who is here, there, and everywhere to see that the work is being properly proceeded with. The carpenters have been at work since six o'clock this nice winter morning. Let us see how they are getting on after breakfast. We cross the darkened stage, and ascending a very narrow staircase at the back thereof, mount into the lower range of flies. A mixture this of the between decks of a ship, a rope walk, and the old woodwork of the chain pier at Brighton. Here are windlasses, capstans, ropes, cables, chains, pulleys innumerable. Take care, or you will stumble across the species of winnowing machine used to imitate the noise of wind, and which is close to the large sheet of copper which makes the thunder. The tin cylinder filled with peas used for rain and hail is downstairs, but you may see the wires or travellers used by flying fairies, and the huge counterweights and lines which work the curtain and act drop. Up then again by a ladder into range of flies number two, where there are more pulleys, windlasses and counterweights, with bridges crossing the stage and lines working the borders and gas-pipes with coloured screens called mediums, which are used to throw a lurid light of a moonlight on scenes of battles or conflagrations where the employment of coloured fires is not desirable. Another ladder, a rope one this time, has still to be climbed, and now we find ourselves close to the roof of the theatre and in the carpenter's shop. Such a noise of sawing and chopping, hammering and chiselling. The shop is a large one, its size corresponding to the area of the stage beneath. Twenty or thirty men are at work, putting together the framework of flats, and covering the framework itself with canvas. Some are constructing the long cylinders or rollers used for drops or cloths while others, on their knees, are busily following with a handsaw the outline of a rock or tree, marked in red lead by the scene-painter on profile, thin wood, required for a set piece. Mr. Tax is in his glory, with his power of nails and screws around him. He pounces on the official immediately. He must have more nails, more hands, spreading out his own emphatically give him hands the stage manager pacifies and promises stand by there while four brawny carpenters rush from another portion of the shop with the pagoda of arabian delights dimly looming through canvas and whitewash a curious race of men are these theatrical carpenters some of them growl bits of italian operas or melodramatic music as they work they are full of traditional lore of the lane and the garden in days of yore. Probably their fathers and grandfathers were theatrical before them, for it is rare to find a carpenter of ordinary life at stage work or vice versa. Malignant members of the ordinary trade whisper even that their work never lasts and is only fit for the ideal carpentry of a theatre. There is a legend also that a stage carpenter, being employed once to make a coffin, constructed it after the Hamlet manner and ornamented it with scroll work. They preserve admirable discipline and obey the master carpenter implicitly, but work once over and out of the theatre, he is no more than one of themselves and takes beer with Tom or Bill and the chair at their committee and sick club reunions in a perfectly republican and fraternal manner. These men labour from six in the morning until six in the evening, and probably, as fifo fum is a heavy pantomime, from seven until the close of the performances. 
at night when the gas battens below the flies are all lighted the heat is somewhat oppressive and if you lie on your face on the floor and gaze through the chinks of the planking you will hear the music in the orchestra and catch an occasional glimpse of the performers on the stage beneath marvellously foreshortened and microscopically diminished the morning we pay our visit a rehearsal is going on below and a hoarse command is wafted from the stage to start that hammering while mark antony is pronouncing his oration over the dead body of caesar the stage manager of course is now wanted downstairs and departs with an oft iterated injunction to get on we too must get on without him which still using fortunio's invisibility we will endeavour to do we enter another carpenter's shop smaller but on the same level and occupying a space above the horseshoe ceiling of the audience part of the theatre a sort of martello of wood occupies the centre of this apartment its summit going through the roof this is at once the ventilator and the chandelier house of the theatre if we open a small door we can descry as our eyes become accustomed to the semi-darkness that it is floored with iron in ornamented scroll-work and opening with a hinged trap we can also see the ropes and pulleys to which are suspended the great centre chandelier and by which it is hauled up every monday morning to be cleaned more carpenters are busily at work at bench and trestles sawing gluing hammering hark we hear a noise like an eight-day clock on a gigantic scale running down they are letting down a pair of flats in the painting-room let us see what they are about in the painting-room itself pushing aside a door for ever on the swing we enter an apartment somewhat narrow if taken in comparison with its length but very lofty half the roof at least is skylight a longitudinal aperture in the flooring traverses the room close to the wall this is the cut or groove half a foot wide and seventy feet in depth perhaps in which hangs a screen of woodwork called a frame on this frame the scene to be painted is placed and by means of a counterweight and a windlass is worked up and down the cut as the painter may require the sky being thus as convenient to his hand as the lowest stone or bit of foliage in the foreground when the scene is finished a signal is given to stand clear below and a bar in the windlass being removed the frame slides with immense celerity down the cut to the level of the stage here the carpenters remove the flats or wings or whatever else may have been painted and the empty frame is wound up again into the painting-room sometimes instead of a cut a bridge is used in this case the scene itself remains stationary and the painter stands on a platform which is wound up and down by a windlass as he may require it a ladder being placed against the bridge if he wishes to descend without shifting the position of his platform when the scene is finished a trap is opened in the floor and the scene slung by ropes to the bottom the cut and frame are it is needless to say most convenient the artist being always able to contemplate the full effect of his work and to provide himself with what colours or sketches he may need without the trouble of ascending and descending the ladder mr brush more bespattered than ever with a double tie brush in his hand is knocking the colour about bravely five or six good men and true his assistants are also employed on the scene he is painting the fairy palace of fivo fum perchance one is seated at a table with something very like the toy theatres of our younger days on which we used to enact that wonderful miller and his men with the famous characters always in one fierce attitude of triumphant defiance we remember of mr park before him it is in reality a model of the stage itself and the little bits of pasteboard he is cutting out and pasting together form portions of a scene he is modelling to scale for the future guidance of the carpenter 
another is fluting columns with a thin brush called a quill tool and a long ruler or straight edge different portions of the scene are allotted to different artists according to their competence from mr brush who finishes and touches up everything down to the fustian jacketed whitewasher who is priming or giving a preparatory coat of whiting and size to a pair of wings if you are at all curious to know how the brilliant scenes you see at night are painted you may watch the whole process of a pair of flats growing into a beautiful picture under mr brush's experienced hands first the scene well primed and looking like a gigantic sheet of coarse cartridge paper on a stretcher is placed on the frame then with a long pole cleft at the end and in which is stuck a piece of charcoal mr brush hastily scrawls as it seems the outline of the scene he is about to paint then he and his assistants draw in a finished outline with a small brush and common ink which darkening as it dries allows the outline to shine through the first layers of colour then the whitewasher labourer as he is technically called is summoned to lay in the great masses of colour sky wall foreground etc which he does with huge brushes then the shadows are picked in by assistants to whom enters speedily mr brush with a sketch in one hand and brushes in the other and he finishes finishes too with a delicacy of manipulation and nicety of touch which will rather surprise you previously impressed as you may have been with an idea that scenes are painted with mops and that scenic artists are a superior class of house painters stay here is the straight line of a cornice to be ruled from one part of the scene to the other a space fifty feet wide perhaps two labourers one at either end hold a string tightly across where the desired line is to be this string has been well rubbed with powdered charcoal and being held up in some part for a moment between the thumb and finger and then smartly vibrated onto the canvas again leaves a mark of black charcoal along the whole length of the line which being followed by the brush and ink serves for the guideline of the cornice again the wall of that magnificent saloon has to be covered with an elaborate scroll-work pattern is all this outlined by the hand think you no a sheet of brown paper perforated with pinholes with a portion of the desired pattern is laid against the scene the whole is then gently beaten with a worsted bag full of powdered charcoal which penetrating through the pinholes leaves a dotted outline capable of repetition ad infinitum by shifting the pattern this is called pouncing then some of the outlines of decoration are stenciled but for foliage and rocks flowers and water i need not tell you my artistical friend that the hand of mr brush is the only pouncer and stenciler for so grand a pantomime as fee-fo-fum a scene will probably after artistic completion be enriched with foil paper and dutch metal admire the celerity with which these processes are effected first an assistant cuts the foil in narrow strips with a penknife another catches them up like magic and glues them another claps them on the canvas and the scene is foiled then mr brush advances with a pot having a lamp beneath filled with a composition of burgundy pitch rosin glue and beeswax called mordant with this and a camel hair brush he delicately outlines the parts he wishes gilt half a dozen assistants rush forward with books of dutch metal and three-fourths of the scene are covered in a trice with squares of glittering dross the superfluous particles are rubbed off with a dry brush and amid a very denian shower of golden particles the outlines of mordant to which the metal has adhered become gradually apparent in a glittering network all 
around this chamber of the arts are hung pounces and stencils like the brown paper patterns in a tailor's shop there is a ledge running right round the room on which is placed a long row of pots filled with the colours used which are ground in water and subsequently tempered with size a huge cauldron of which is now simmering over the ample fireplace the colour grinder himself stands before a table supporting an ample stone slab on which with a marble muller he is grinding dutch pink lustily the painter's palette is not the oval one used by picture painters but a downright four-legged table the edges of which are divided into compartments each holding its separate dab of colour while the centre serves as a space whereon to mix and graduate the tints the whitewashed walls are scrawled over with rough sketches and memoranda in charcoal or red lead while a choice engraving here and there a box of water-colours some delicate flowers in a glass some velvet drapery pinned against the wall hint that in this timber-roofed unpapered uncarpeted size and whitewash smelling workshop there is art as well as industry though it is only of late years mind you that scene painters have been recognised as artists at all they were called daubers whitewashers paper hangers by that class of artists to whom the velvet cap the turn-down collars and the ormolu frame were as the air they breathed these were the gentlemen who thought it beneath the dignity of art to make designs for wood engravers to paint porcelain to draw patterns for silk manufacturers gradually they found out that the scene painters made better architects landscape painters professors of perspective than they themselves did gradually they remembered that in days gone by such men as salvator rosa inigo jones and philip de luthaborg were scene painters and that in our own times one stanfield had not disdained size and whitewash nor a certain robert thought it derogatory to wield the double tie brush scene painting thenceforward looked up and even the heavy portals of the academy moved creakingly on their hinges for the admittance of distinguished professors of scenic art we have been hindering mr brush quite long enough i think even though we are invisible so let us descend this crazy ladder which leads from the painting-room down another flight of stairs so keep your hands out before you and tread cautiously for the management is chary of gas and the place is pitch dark now as i open this door shade your eyes with your hand a moment lest the sudden glare of light dazzle you this is the property room in this vast long low room are manufactured the properties all the stage furniture and paraphernalia required during the performance of a play look around you and wonder the walls and ceiling are hung the floor and tables cumbered with properties shylock's knife and scales ophelia's coffin paul pry's umbrella macbeth's truncheon the cauldron of the witches harlequin's bat the sickle of norma mambrino's helmet swords lanterns banners belts hats daggers wooden sirloins of beef louis quatorze chairs papier mache goblets pantomime masks stage money whips spears lutes flasks of rich burgundy fruit rattles fish plaster images drums cocked hats spurs and bugle horns are strewn about without the slightest attempt at arrangement or classification tilted against the wall on one end is a four-legged banqueting table very grand indeed white marble top and golden legs at this table will noble knights and ladies feast richly off wooden fowls and brown paper pies quaffing meanwhile deep potations of toast and water sherry or haply golden goblets full of nothing at all 
some of the goblets together with elaborate flasks of exhilarating emptiness and dishes of rich fruit more deceptive than dead sea apples for they have not even got ashes inside them are nailed to the festive board itself on very great occasions the bowl is wreathed with cotton wool and the viands smoke with a cloud of powdered lime dreadfully deceptive are these stage banquets and stage purses the haughty hospodar of hungary drinks confusion to bold bandit of bulgaria in a liquorless cup vainly thirsting meanwhile for a pint of mild porter from the adjacent hostelry deep are his retainers in the enjoyment of warden pies and lusty capons while their too often empty interiors cry dolorously for three pennies of cold boiled beef liberal is he also of broad florins and purses of moy doors accidentally drawing perchance at the same time a lombardian debenture for his boots from the breast of his doublets the meat is a sham and the wine is a sham and the money a sham but are there no other shams o oh brothers and sisters besides those of the footlights have i not dined with my legs under sham mahogany illuminated by sham wax lights has not a sham hostess helped me to sham boiled turkey has not my sham health been drunk by sham friends do I know no haughty hospodar of Hungary myself? There is one piece, and one piece only, on the stage in which a real banquet, a genuine spread, is provided. That piece is no song, no supper. However small may be the theatre, however low the state of the finances, the immemorial tradition is respected and a real leg of mutton graces the board once the chronicle goes there was a heartless monster in property man shape who substituted a dish of mutton chops for the historical jiggot execration abhorrence expulsion followed his iniquitous fraud and he was from that day a property man accursed curiously enough while the leg of mutton in no song no supper is always real the cake introduced in the same piece is as invariably a counterfeit the old stock wooden cake of the theatre when it shall be known why waiters wear white neckcloths and dustmen shorts and ankle jacks the proximate cause of this discrepancy will perhaps be pointed out to return to the property room of the theatre royal hatton garden mr gorget the property master as he is called is working with almost delirious industry he has an imperial crown on his head recently gilt the crown not the head and placed there to dry while on the table before him lies a mass of modelling clay on which his nimble fingers are shaping out the matrix of a monstrous human face for a pantomimic mask how quickly and with what facility he moulds the hideous physiognomy into shape squeezing the eyelids flattening the nose elongating the mouth furrowing the cheeks when this clay model is finished it will be well oiled and a cast taken from it in plaster of paris into this cast oiled again strips of brown paper well glued and sized will be pasted till a proper thickness is obtained when dry the cast is removed and the hardened paper mask ready for colouring at this latter process an assistant whose nose and cheeks are plentifully enriched with dutch metal and splashes of glue is at work he is very liberal with rose pink to the noses black to the eyebrows and white to the eye then mrs gorget a mild little woman who has been assiduously spangling a demon's helmet proceeds to ornament the masks with huge masses of oakum and horsehair red brown and black which are destined to serve as their coiffure 
busily other assistants are painting tables, gilding goblets, and manufacturing the multifarious and bewilderingly miscellaneous articles required in the comic business of a pantomime. The sausages which the clown purloins, the bustle he takes from the young lady, the fish, eggs, poultry, warming pans, babies, pint pots, butcher's trays and legs of mutton incidental to his chequered career. Others besides adults are useful in the property room. A bright-eyed little girl, Mr. Gorget's youngest, is gravely speckling a plum pudding, while her brother, a stalwart rogue of eleven, sits on a stool with a pot full of yellow ochre in one hand and a brush in the other, with which he is giving a plentiful coat of bright yellow colour to a row containing a dozen pairs of hunting boots. These articles of costume will gleam to-night on the legs and feet of the huntsman of His Highness the Hospodar, with whom you are already acquainted. Their wearers will stamp their soles on the merry greensward, ha-ha, waving above their heads the tin porringers supposed to contain Rhine wine or Byrisha beer. Mr. Gorget will have no easy task for the next three weeks. He will have to be up early and late until fee-fo-fum is produced. The nightly performances have, meanwhile, to be attended to, and any new properties wanted must be made, and any old ones spoilt must be replaced, in addition to what is required for the pantomime. And something more than common abilities must have abiding place in a property man, although he does not receive uncommonly liberal remuneration. He must be a decent upholsterer, a carpenter, a wig-maker, a painter, a decorator, accurate as regards historical propriety, a skilful modeller, a facile carver, a tasteful embroiderer, a general handyman and jack of all trades. He must know something of pyrotechnics, a good deal of carving and gilding, and a little of mechanics. For this he gets perhaps fifty shillings a week. Let us come away from the property room, giving a glance into that grim, cavernous, coal-holy place on the left, where all the broken-up, used-out properties are thrown, and is a sort of limbo of departed pantomimes, and peeping curiously also into the room where, on racks and on hooks, are arranged the cuirasses, muskets, swords, spears, and yeomanry helmets which form the armoury of the theatre. Time presses, and we must have a look at the proceedings in the wardrobe. Mr. Baster is busily stitching, with many other stitchers, females, all of a row. His place of work is anything but large, and movement is rendered somewhat inconvenient, moreover, by a number of heavy presses, crammed to repletion with the costumes of the establishment. Mr. Baster has been overhauling his stock, to see what he can conveniently use again, and what is really wanted new. He has passed in review the crimson velvet noblemen, the green serge retainers, the spangled courtiers, the glazed calico slaves, the shirts, shapes, romaldies, and strips of other days. He has held up to the light last year's clown's dress, and shakes his head ruefully when he contemplates the rents and rivings, the rags and tatters, into which that once brilliant costume is reduced. Clown must evidently be new all over. His forewoman is busy spangling Harlequin's patchwork dress while in the hands of his assistants, sprites and genii, slaves and evil spirits, are in various stages of completion. So in the ladies' wardrobe, where Mr. Lodgy and her assistants are stitching for dear life at sea-nymphs and sirens and elfins' costume, and where Miss Mezzanine, who is to play Columbine, is agonisingly inquisitive as to the fit of her skirt and spangles. Work, work, work everywhere. In the bleak morning, when playgoers of the previous night have scarcely finished their first sleep, at night, to the music of the orchestra below and amid the hot glare of the gas, Mr. Tax carries screws in his waistcoat pockets and screws in his mouth. 
Mr. Gorget grows absolutely rigid with glue, while his assistant's heads and hands are unpleasantly enriched with Dutch metal and foil paper, and the staircase is blocked up with frantic waiters laden with chops and stout for Mr. Brush and his assistants. The management smiles approvingly and winces uneasily occasionally as Boxing Day draws near. The stage manager is unceasing in his get-ons. All day long the private door of the management is assailed by emissaries from Mr. Tax for more nails, from Mr. Brush for more Venetian red and burnt sienna, from Mr. Baster for more velvet, from Mr. Gorget for more glue. The management moves uneasily in its chair. Great expense it says if it should fail give us more nails hands venetian red velvet and glue and will not fail chorus the ants behind the bays nor must you suppose that the pantomimists clown harlequin pantaloon and columbine nor the actors playing in the opening nor the fairies who fly nor the demons who howl nor the sprites who tumble are idle Every day the opening and comic scenes are rehearsed. Every day a melancholy man, called the Repetiteur, takes his station on the stage, which is illumined by one solitary gas jet, and to the dollar music he conjures from his fiddle, the pantomimists, in oversuits of coarse linen, tumble, dance, jump and perform other gymnastic exercises in the gloom until their bones ache and the perspiration streams from their limbs work 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 and christmas eve is here nails hammers paint brushes needles muscles and limbs going in every direction mr brush has not had his boots cleaned for a week and has forgotten what sheets and counterpanes mean no snapdragon for mr tax no hunt the slipper for mr gorget pleasant christmas greetings and good wishes though and general surmises that the pantomime will be a stunning one christmas day and alas and alack no christmas beef and pudding save that from the cook-shop and perchance the spare repast in the covered basin which little polly bruggs brings stalwart bill bruggs the carpenter who is popularly supposed to be able to carry a pair of wings beneath each arm incessant fiddling from the repetiteur trip rally and jump for the pantomimists work on the stage which is covered with canvas and stooping painters working with brushes stuck in bamboo walking sticks work in the flies and work underneath the stage on the umbrageous mezzanine floor where the cellarmen are busily slinging sinks and rises and greasing traps an overflow of properties deluges the green room huge masks leer at you in narrow passages pantomimic wheelbarrows and barrel organs beset you at every step so all christmas night hurrah for boxing day the compliments of the season and the original dustman tommy and billy suffering slightly from indigestion stand with their noses glued against the window panes at home watching anxiously the rain in the puddles or the accumulating snow on the housetops little mary's mind is filled with radiant visions of the resplendent sashes she is to wear and the gorgeous fairies she is to see john the footman is to escort the housemaid into the pit even joe barrakin of the new cut who sells us our cauliflowers will treat his missus to a seat in the gallery for the first performance of harlequin fee fo fum there the last clink of the hammer is heard, the last stroke of the brush, and the last stitch of the needle. The management glances with anxious approval at the elaborately funny bill prepared of the evening's entertainment. It is six o'clock in the evening. The clown, 
Signor Braunarini of the Theatre's Royal, has a jug of barley water made, his only beverage during his tumbling, and anxiously assures himself that there is a red-hot poker introduced into the comic business. Else, says he, the pantomime is sure to fail. It is astonishing what a close connection there is between the success of a pantomime and that red-hot poker. Seven o'clock, and one last frantic push to get everything ready. Tommy, Billy, Mary, Papa and Mamma arrive in flies, broughams or cabs. The footman and housemaid are smiling in the pit, and Joe Barrakin is amazingly jolly and thirsty with his missus in the gallery. Now then, music, play up, order, order, and throw him over. George Barnwell, or Jane Shaw, inaudible, of course, and then Harlequin Fee Fo Fum, or the Enchanted Fairy of the Island of Abracadabra. Fun, frolic, and gaiety, splendour, beauty, and blue fire. Hey for fun! How are you tomorrow? and, I hope, success and crowded houses till the middle of February, both for the sake of the author, the management, and the Theatre Royal Hatton Garden generally. The ants behind the bays have worked well, but they have their reward in the glorious success of the pantomime they have laboured so hard at. They may wash their faces and have their boots cleaned now, and who shall say that they do not deserve their beer tonight and their poor salaries next Saturday? Dear readers, as Christmas time comes on, pause a little ere you utterly condemn these poor play acting people as utter profligates, as irreclaimable rogues and vagabonds. Consider how hard they work, how precarious is their employment how honestly they endeavour to earn their living and to do their duty in their state of life. Admit that there is some skill, some industry, some perseverance in all this, not misdirected if promoting harmless fancy and innocent mirth. End of Getting Up a Pantomime by George Augustus Sala Recording by Ruth Golding Christmas 2012